Now we look at implementation. You always or often have a coaxial cable leading to an antenna. And the only important parts that I want to highlight here is the attenuation per meter goes up as frequency goes up. The loss in a cable is higher if the cable is thin. It's also dependent on the technology used, but generally speaking, if it's thin, it has got a higher loss and you can use it for um, smaller lengths or for lower frequencies. And then typically you find this curve. So if you find the losses are high and you want to go to lower losses, you can see these cables are much thicker. So cable loss is also typically related to the diameter of the coaxial cable and the cost of course increases as you want lower losses. So I think those are the important aspects. Look at the distance, you know, is it, is it relevant? In other words, if you've got half a meter, you can see that perhaps 0 0.2, 0 0.4 dB loss is not relevant. But if you're going to use um, 10 meters, then that's becoming 4 dBs and that's becoming 6 dBs. And then of course the frequency at which you wish to operate. So um, power handling, and the thicker uh, ones if you've got high power transmitters, but often not the case in uh, cellular and Wi-Fi cases. Bend radius is important and it is defined for each cable. Typically the thinner ones you can bend sharper than the fatter ones, which is useful in an enclosure where you only need a, a small bit of cable price. And then an important one, connector availability. Not all cables can connect to all connectors. Connectors is a nice topic. Um, you get a variety and these are just the illustration. That's a smallish connector called a sub miniature, um, I think type A. And uh, one of the interesting aspects, I'm not sure most people may know it, the sex of a connector is defined by that inner part. So if the inner part's a pin, it's a male connector. Um, that guy there, you can see the inner part is a pin, even though the outer part is a receptacle, in other words, may look like female, the sex of a connector is defined by the inner part. That guy there, end type connector, would be a male end type connector. This guy here, or lady, if you want to call it that, is a female, okay, because you can see the inner part is a hole. And then like um, the rest of life, we also got sort of some sexual variations uh, where people would use a connector which on the outside looks like a male, uh, but on the inside, uh, it's actually a female. Uh, often these were dictated when people said, uh, especially the American FCC, they would say that we uh, want a certain ERP, in other words, effective radiated power, and that's a combination of the power of the transmitter and the antenna. So they said to the guys, if you supply an antenna with, we want to make sure you, the guy can only use the right antenna and they have to change um, something like this, which makes it impossible to put a standard connector on. But of course, the industry being clever, nowadays you can buy what they call reverse polarity SMA connectors. They're very different in size, by the way. So you find that this guy can connect to the thicker cables, but it will virtually be impossible to connect that guy to a thicker cable. The solution often is to use an intermediate cable and make a little lead that would connect the two to each other if you really need to do this. This is a connector that's used in vehicles so you can see it's mechanical. It's, it's very similar to one of these. I think that one there, but it mechanically interlocks group dust, water protection. Um, and of course, this is also important in selecting the right connector. The one thing that's very important is um, beware of making up your own cables. Um, if you do make up cables, I would say you must always measure it with a RF network analyzer because that's the only way I've seen so many connectors, uh, often because they're badly connected, but even some connectors just don't work at the frequencies where you may require them to be um, operational. So either buy them from a reputable um, manufacturer that measures them, or otherwise be very careful of just making it up in the field and um, assuming that it would work. This is perhaps one of the nicer ones. Um, this is indicating the separation between antennas. And people ask me all the time, and many people can criticize our figures here, but they're pretty accurate. In other words, how far do you need to position things apart? And you can see it's a function of the gain of the antenna, the blue line there. So if it's a low gain antenna, 
And if they're higher gain, you have to position them further apart for MIMO performance. Reason for that is that the beam gets narrower, so the reflections are no longer that far off the path of the main beam, and then they need to be further apart to get some deep correlation. So these numbers here, I think, are excellent numbers to use. If it's a panel antenna, it's from the one edge of the panel to the next edge here. And if it's an omni antenna, it's of course from the center of the two antennas, or perhaps a side, but should be more or less the same thing. So this perhaps is a one curve I would print out and use because I get asked this question all the time. It's not a scientific answer, but it's the one that would most of the time give you quite good results. Lightning, and we often get asked about lightning. Uh, lightning, the best model to describe lightning is using the rolling ball model. Um, if you're looking at short structures, a rolling ball gets to your 45 degree type of rule that people have used for years. In other words, you find that that ball, so wherever the ball touch, lightning can hit. Let me just start at that point. So if you look at this rolling ball, if it rolls up, Lightning can eat anywhere on this building, even though this is higher. People didn't believe me, I promise you. We've had high-rise buildings, fourth floor down, the guy gets hit by lightning. So this is a very real impact once a building is more than about 50, 60 meters high. If it's small, it's this size, like a little tower, 20 or 30 meters high, you can see no problem. But this is the rolling ball model. It's a very, very good guideline in terms of where things can be hit by lightning. So do not believe in certain high structures that mounting it away from the top will protect you against lightning. Rolling ball is the most accurate way of doing it. And if it's short structures, your 45 degree um, rule, which normally says if you've got something there, 45 degrees from it either side, you'll be protected. That's quite true if it's a small um, structure. Um, Antenna mounting pole must be earthed. I know people hate this, but if it's not earthed, you're achieving nothing because that rod that you put up on top that protects the unit will be hit. And if it's not earthed, it will arc over to the coaxial cable and run all the way into the house, arcing over to everything else that it can hit. Okay. If there's a equipment building and an, another building, for example, if there's a mast and there's equipment building, the earths must be interconnected. Um, people are once again arguing with me that if I've got a mast outside and a building, I don't want to connect those earths because the mast is going to be hit. What happens when that mast is hit, if it is not connected to the earth of the building, it will rise up to a few thousand volts and everything will arc over to the equipment inside the building. If they are connected, both will rise up to a few thousand volts and there's no difference between them. So. Do believe me, you interconnect earths between, say, a mast and a building, or one building and the other building. Here's an indication of the rolling ball. Once again, if the mast is high, and when I say high, I mean sort of 60, 70 meters plus, you have to start protecting things on this side. Um, if you want to protect them, you can just put a spike out there and a spike out there, okay, so that the ball can't touch the antenna. So it's not impossible. At first, people look at this and say, how oh, the hell? They are protect things, you actually put a, a spike out the, uh, horizontally so that the ball can't touch the antenna, in which case lightning won't hit it. But just being above the top is not good enough. On smaller units, that's fine because the ball, relatively speaking, will almost form your 45 degree line. And just having a pole higher than the antenna would be good enough. The rule that I use in terms of small structures that's like mounting antennas on roofs and uh, masts smaller masts is that the mast must extend above the antenna the amount that the antenna extends away from the sorry away from the mast horizontally so if it's a log periodic like this guy here that spike there should be the same length as that and if it's a panel antenna it can be much lower because it only needs to be the same distance as that distance over there um, for omnis, it's always best to mount them at the top in terms of performance, okay? And you can mount them like that. You do risk that lightning can hit them, but in the case of a properly earthed antennas, and if you actually go to the inside of, for example, our antennas, we always make sure the whole antenna is earthed through to the braid and earthed through to the bracket. 
you won't get damage except the antenna will go to pot. Okay. So sometimes if the antenna is not mounted on a specifically high structure on a building and there's still trees around it, mounting it at the top is not bad. Um, but you do risk losing the antenna and most probably the equipment will be damaged. So I wouldn't do it on a tall structure that's very likely to be by and lightning one way or the other. That is it. I do hope that uh, we managed to ask some of the questions. The talk really comes from addressing many, many questions from um, various of our customers, customers, customers. And uh, what I would really encourage you is where things were unclear in terms of the presentation and ask questions. I'm not sure how many people have asked questions uh, in the chat box um, we can sit and answer some of them uh, people that's finished listening can actually um, leave the webinar but you can still write us emails that's why the emails are there at the bottom and uh, we can answer questions it's very difficult especially where one sits in a webinar and i'm just talking to you to see what's the stuff that may have confused people so please don't hesitate ask the questions and we can clarify them and most probably will send to all people that attended the answers to these um, questions. I hope this has been useful. Thank you very much for listening to me for this time. Hi, Andre, um, Stephen speaking. Um, we do have three questions that you can maybe just help with. Um, yes. The first question is regarding MIMO. And the question was, um, what type of polarization? Is it better to have polarization or spatial diversity or spatial separation when we are looking at MIMA? Okay, MIMA, it's always, always better to have polarization. Um, the only problem with polarization is that you only have two completely decorrelated polarizations. Those are 90 degrees, whether it's plus minus 45 or vertical horizontal. And people argue with me. But even if your base station is vertical horizontal and your customer's um, unit is 45, you still get full decorrelation. So always best to use polarization. But of course, if you need to go more than um, two by two, your only option is to go for spatial. But always best to go for um, polarization first up to two by two, and then you can go for um, space diversity. Thank you, Andre. And then there was another question uh, regarding the thick antennas that you referred to. That's the Omni antennas. Um, what makes them wide band? Um, maybe you can just give, give a little bit more information as to why are they wide band and the thinner antennas are not wide band? Um, I suppose the first answer is uh, if you, and that gets back to the theory, um, there's an antenna theory, and if you go look it up, there's something called the antenna thickness factor. And that's actually the log of the antenna length divided by its diameter. And that determines the fundamental bandwidth of, say, a dipole antenna. There's another factor, though, if you go more and more broadband, is that you also have to cater for more frequencies. So you have to shape that um, radiator of yours. And you can only do it you can't do it on a single radiator. You almost need to provide additional radiators in order to handle the different bands. The most difficult part is when you go for a high gain antenna, because on a high gain antenna is essentially often using two antennas that space above each other. And of course, as the wavelength change, you may find that they cause the beam to squeak upwards. Um, lately, we use a fantastic new technology called closely coupled dipoles where we can create a constant phase difference across there. But none of that can happen if you don't have width to play with one way or the other. Uh, we even have to feed those closely coupled dipoles. We have to feed them multiple places along the length. Now you can just imagine just getting feeds up there requires a certain amount of width. So um, there's a number of reasons, but certainly impossible to get without um, using some width in order to get there. Good, thank you, Andre. Um, I think that brings us to the end of the webinar. Um, if there are any other questions, please do send it to us. Uh, you'll see the email address info at pointing.tech. And uh, please send us your questions or just carry on logging them in the questions box uh, within this webinar and we'll get back to each of you individually. 
Um, and if there's any topics we'll also that, that are of interest to everybody, we'll send it to everybody. We'll also be distributing the, the slides and also a link to YouTube with uh, this webinar. Thank you very much, Andre. Thanks a lot. Um, you guys can just uh, maybe stay online for a few seconds just to answer the, um, the questions at the end, uh, just to write the webinar. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody.